are minor for me in comparison to, uh, I remember a number of years ago when I was um, in an attempt to uh, do a leverage buyout of Jordan Telecom, my, uh, my hotel was blown up by Al Qaeda. Um, so uh, so we, we moved hotel. And we, <laughs> and all I had left was the uh, passport and, and my cell phone and the clothes I was wearing. Welcome to this Back Up web series. My name is Dan Nebraski, and this week my guests are the CEO of TowerSign, Joe Burton, as well as North Atlantic Acquisition CEO, Gary Quinn. We discuss the growth of the digital identity and authentication space, where TowerSign fits within the market, highlighted by some truly mind-boggling stats on user interactions. We also cover multiple aspects of just how this transaction came together. Please enjoy my conversation with Joe and Gary. A lot of people aren't going to understand the burden uh, on being a leader uh, in an organization that's responsible for potentially thousands of people. Uh, it's just not something that you know, many people are going to be able to relate to. What do you think it is about you uh, that really has helped you to rise and maintain to that executive level throughout your career? Well, you know, um, it, it's a tough one. Um, I think having been brought up in a very small family business and a big family, if you will, in many respects, I think managing a development team and then managing a business unit and eventually having the uh, privilege of, uh, of of running a company or two really, um, I think, bit by bit, uh, I've gotten there. but always being in the service of the people I work for, not the other way around, is uh, really important to me. Do you think that uh, that's a common trait among all business leaders? Like, what, what do you think it is that really sets uh, true like, enterprise leadership apart uh, from everybody else? Uh, you know, I think when we talk about, um, I think all leaders are different. Um, many of the best leaders that I uh, that I identify with, many of the best leaders that I um, try to emulate or learn from, are indeed uh, what I would call servant leaders. Leaders that are in the service of their employees, their customers, and their shareholders, and are really just trying to remove obstacles and create environments where all those people can. Um, can, can do great things. There are certainly other leaders that are utterly focused on the bottom line every minute of the day, um, clearly delivering that great business results on my mind, but I'd rather remove obstacles so the uh, 600 people at Telesign can uh, deliver that business result, not just me. Uh, you you uh, highlighted just kind of top level a few of the organizations that you've been involved with, but could you uh, walk me through what your journeys look like? Um, indeed, uh, it's uh, been uh, it's been very interesting. I actually uh, I grew up in a blue collar family in Ohio. Started putting myself through uh, through state university and um, really learned for the first time what burn rate is, because I thought I had four years of money, and after a year and a half, I was out. <laughs> Uh, trip through the uh, trip through the U.S. Army to get the GI Bill, finish school, and really became an engineer. Worked at a company building everything to run a uh, a uh, supermarket, the scanning cash registers and inventory. Moved to Seattle so I could climb mountains and write software, and uh, uh, went in with a startup that was building telecommunication software got acquired by Cisco Systems, what we all now know as the huge networking company, and uh, worked my way through as their chief technology officer for unified communications, uh, really when uh, voice and video over the internet was becoming a major force. Spent some time at Polycom and Plantronics helping a a uh, hardware uh, company uh, turned into a software company. And then after a little time off, was lucky enough to uh, to get the call on TeleSign. And I'm excited. Such a great company for me. 
So I'm hearing a, a few parallels here between you and Patagonia. Uh, yeah, gosh, uh, if, uh, if if I could only be so lucky, uh, yes, I think Patagonia is an amazing company to admire. Now, I didn't start companies around my mountain climbing habit, but uh, nevertheless, I've tended to be places where I could work with amazing people, uh, building great tech while being uh, while being in the mountains as much as I can. Right, I agree. I, I, I like to. Um, you know, kind of dive into your background a little bit, but I'd like to know of the several transactions that you've been involved with throughout your career, what's been the most challenging one uh, that's presented itself? And maybe you could you know, sprinkle in uh, a few along the way that you could expand on as well. Yeah, so so, so, so my background is, is, is telecommunications, um, which led me to this uh, dovetailing with, with Joe and a, and a similar background. I grew up blue collar uh, as well in 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 Ireland and had a had a short professional athlete career uh, before being given an opportunity in telecoms by one of those servant leaders that Joe mentioned, a telecoms entrepreneur called Dennis O'Brien, who built uh, telecommunications organizations across uh, developing markets, LATAM and the South Pacific, and. Uh, gave me great responsibility to uh, around helping to build and finance those organizations. Uh, Digicel was the name of that, that business. It's, it's still very much in operation. And I then went on, stayed in, in, in telecoms with, uh, with Blackstone and uh, uh, was vice chairman of investment banking with uh, Credit Suisse on uh, telecommunications and, and media. So was very fortunate to see a, a very broad range of situations and, and opportunities. Um, but we, I, I, I found a, a meeting of minds on, uh, um, on the future of, of telecoms platforms and how to protect the consumer with Joe. So, so we, I was delighted when we actually uh, came, came across him. Um, the, the current geopolitical considerations uh, um, are minor for me in comparison to, uh, I remember a number of years ago when I was um, in an attempt to uh, do a leverage buyout of Jordan Telecom, my, uh, my hotel was blown up by Al Qaeda. Um, so uh, so we we moved hotel and we <laughs> and all I had left was the uh, passport and and my cell phone and the clothes I was wearing. Uh, so um, a few little hiccups in in the market, the Dow going up or down a number of points uh, um, is put into perspective <laughs> for, for me. I, I gotta tell you. Uh, a terrorist attack in your hotel was not a response I was accounting for for <laughs> presenting a challenge. <laughs> I, I, I called my wife and 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 uh, she said, uh, "You know, what are you going to do?" I said, uh, "We're going to buy another suit and keep going. <laughs> That's what we're going to do." <laughs> That's a completely different direction than I was. <laughs> my follow-up is going to be like so what did you learn from that <laughs> to be resilient to to be tenacious keep going eyes on the prize focus on the deal but 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 moreover yeah. you know we were working with great people it was it was an excellent organization and um, that was doing great work not only in the country but in in the region and i saw directly the the benefits um, that appropriate telecoms organizations can bring um, and, and, and technology platforms can bring to the development of a country, not only economically, but, but, but socially as well, uh, bringing appropriate information and education to bear and allowing for uh, um, democracy to, to move into areas where it hadn't before. So I'm not saying that I was a major player for any of that, but I saw directly uh, the benefits that that telecommunications and 
an appropriate protection of people, which telesign offers can, can actually can do. So you can make it, you really right. can make a difference. So with that, could you give me uh, um, more context and more background on the rest of your team at North Atlantic? So you know, we put the team at North Atlantic together um, to avail of opportunities, particularly of a bi-coastal nature. And, and, and by, by bi-coastal, I mean Europe and, 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 and North America. Um, and, yeah, and, and, and that's how we found uh, the telesign um, opportunity as well through our European telecoms network because uh, Telesign's uh, current shareholder is a, a proximus the Belgian telecoms organization. And, and everyone on our team was somebody who, um, who I did deals with along the way, um, who I had a deep respect for and, 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 and brought a lot to the table from a, from Dimitri Paniotopoulos, the former vice chairman of Procter & Gamble globally, uh, Andrew Morgan, president of Diageo, the, uh, uh, the international drinks organization. Uh, our president, uh, Patrick Doran, is a, 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 an entrepreneur in, in Europe and has built and sold companies many times. And, and so we were we were able to not only from a, a network perspective bring opportunities to bear, but the institutional and entrepreneurial uh, mindsets combined uh, brought so much more to the, uh, to the table. Um, and, and so when we were analyzing and strategizing um, in relation to opportunities on, on what's appropriate, we, you know, we were very fortunate to be able to bring some great and successful uh, minds and experiences to bear. Um, and, and equally, all of us immediately saw the opportunity uh, that, that, that was Telesign that's, you know, for us, so compelling and appealing. Now, I do want to talk about how this transaction came together in a little while. But I think it's important to get context uh, for a better understanding of what uh, Telesign actually is. So, you know, to me, it feels like the, the the actual model is that if I'm not hearing about the company, you're actually doing your jobs. So, with that, could you give more context on what the origins of the company are? You know, I think this is actually one of the things that's so incredible about Telesign. So, when we're back in 2005 with some students that are actually sitting there. Bear in mind, iPhone hasn't been invented. Android hasn't been invented. Um, many of us don't even have full broadband at home across the entire country anyway, let alone the world. And these brilliant students at the time say, you know what? This is going to be the most important thing in your life. It's going to be incredibly important that we can make sure that the mobile phone actually really is the phone it's supposed to be. It hasn't been hacked, taken over by somebody else. It's really with the owner. It hasn't been picked up by, by, uh, by somebody else because we're going to be banking there. We're going to be gaming there. We really need to develop to, to deliver a security system to authenticate that the phone is really the phone, the user is really the user. So if you think about doing that pre-iPhone, pre-mobile internet all, almost, they were just incredibly ahead of their time. Now, you mentioned that um, if, uh, if Telesign's doing its job right, chances are you won't even know you're using it. Well, one of the places that, if you know it or not, you do see Telesign pretty often. One of their original problem uh, uh, products was two-factor authentication over SMS. So when you get sent that little code when you're logging onto a website that says type this back in, very often Telesign sent that. 
you're typing it back into TeleSign. And the reason so many companies choose us for that is when you type it back in, we're not only comparing that little code, but we're actually checking 2,200 different security characteristics to make sure that you're really you. It really looks like your phone, looks like your network, looks like an IP address it should be on, typical behavior for you, doesn't look like a well-known bot attack and so forth. So um, just an astonishing insight at the uh, beginning of Telesite into what the world was gonna look like 15 or so years later. So that certainly jumps us forward to the present. But could you actually walk me through how the industry has actually evolved over those 15 to 17 years? And boy, you know, that's uh isn't that a uh, a question? And Gary, help me out if you think of anything since you're an expert in this area. But certainly during that time, we saw Telesign and a couple of other people get on the early digital identity with two-factor authentication. Um, we saw some, frankly, some low-cost providers jump into the industry that would literally send you the code a one, two, three, you send back one, two, three, and they said, good enough, that's you. Completely not good enough, okay? So we saw, uh, we saw the industry expand, low cost people jump in. We saw email messages for authentication. I think we've all seen this arms race of uh, security questions. You have a name, you have a password, and you have a PIN, and you have your mother's maiden name and your first pet and the street you grew up on, on and on and on. What we're seeing here is actually as economic value in the world progressively moves online, everything that we do from banking, education, gaming, on and on and on moves online. Unfortunately, the bad guys move in too. So we have this arms race of more security, more bad guys, more security, more bad guys. And at Telesign, I think our thesis on all this is you can't stay ahead of the bad guys that way. This only can happen with machine learning behavioral models that deeply understand the proper movement of a phone number, the proper movement of a digital identity. And we can really spot adaptions in the usage patterns rather than just yet another security question to be answered. So our prediction going forward is some of the safest systems are actually going to be the ones that ask you the least because we're doing this constant monitoring. When you get asked five, six, seven security questions, that's actually a sign of a non-adaptive system. It's a sign of something that's relatively old school, and we think there's a better way. And what's actually going into that training of the machine learning? Boy, um, a lot of things. Some of the reason that Telesign, it would appear from the outside that we're in two businesses at once, that we're both this digital identity company that we're very excited about, but we also will deliver notifications from a business to an end user over text messaging, over WhatsApp, Viber, many of these social systems around the world. So because we deliver these messages and have interactions um, between billions of, subs of subscribers across 195 countries, we really see a tremendous amount of flow. So we see about 5 billion unique phone numbers transit our systems every month. This allows us to really understand what Gary uh, traveling looks like versus Gary's phone being hacked. We understand what a carrier network that's behaving normally in Malaysia looks like, as opposed to a network that's being faked in a, uh, in a data center somewhere. 
by, by actually building up 15 years of patterns, seeing 5 billion uh, uh, numbers a month, doing transactions for 1,700 enterprises every day, including eight of the 10 biggest ones on the internet, we really have the right insights to train those models in a pretty special way. Uh, uh, this sounds like an absolutely massive amount of data that you're uh, both collecting and then sorting through, but what does that actually mean for security purposes? Well, you know, uh, you beat me to it. The fascinating part of this, and one of the things I'm most um, uh, proud of, Telesign actually holds on to an extraordinarily small amount of data. As we look at data privacy around the world, as we look at satisfying the requirements of GDPR and GDPR-like laws across the globe, satisfying eight of the 10 biggest companies in the world that were compliant, were safe, were redundant, that we have the systems their business can depend on, we actually train these machine learning models, glean the insights around behavior, and then we throw the data away re rather quickly. I actually don't have a list where if we fed in your phone number, I do not have, here's the last 15 calls you made, the times your location changed. I simply have a model that says, um, that says what range of, of IP addresses should you be associated for? What are the kinds of behaviors you should be involved in? And then when we get asked a security question from one of our customers, we are able to take a phone number, an IP address, an email address, and typically in a 10th of a second or less, anywhere in the world, we can actually pass back on a scale of one to a thousand, how likely is this to really be Joe, really be Joe's phone? And something very important, we pass back a set of explainable AI reasons of why we said what we said. So something I'm really proud of, when we look at the ethical AI movement going forward, the idea of AIs that make important decisions about our life and don't explain why they said what they said, this is going to be a real issue. We're out in front of it. Uh, we actually are able to not store data. There's nothing really to be hacked. Um, I mean, it might be stored for a very small amount of time until it's processed, but we don't have a big data store. And then we explain why we said what we said, which we think is, is going to be really important. I do want to be able to take a step back here and actually build on the foundation of what you're actually offering. So could you break down what the product segments actually look like? Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to get into to rabbit holes here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, if we go all the way to the top at Telesign, why do Telesigners come to work every day? And yes, they call themselves Telesigners. It's kind of cool. Uh, Telesigners come to work every day because our internal mission as a company is to make the digital world safe for everyone. That's what we do. We pitch up every day. And when we talk about everyone, uh, I was in a lovely uh, strategy meeting yesterday. Yes, a few of us are really in the office right now. I was in a lovely strategy meeting yesterday where we were looking at the 7.1 billion smartphone subscriptions in the world and talking about what we need to, and by the way, real number, some people have two, some people have none, 7.1 billion uh, smartphone subscriptions in the world. And what do we need to do regionally to help all these different people be safe, secure, first-class citizens in the digital economy? So that's the mission um, actually at Telesign. To do that, we think of our product around four big use cases. Anytime, anytime an enterprise and a, a consumer, one of us, want to come together and have a relationship, 
So think of you either want to create an account on a website or you want to download an app to your phone, if you will. If that app has an account behind it, if they know something about you, four things have to happen during the lifetime of the enterprise and the consumer uh, having a relationship. Number one, you've got to create an account, typically called, called an onboarding. Now, during that onboarding, we have to be sure that Joe's really Joe, Joe's phone is really Joe's phone, but if, if we ask him 40 darn questions, he's just going to abandon and move on. So how do we make that onboarding happen simple and easy, but yet we're really sure it's him, not a, ha a hacker, not a bot, not a bad guy? Once the, once the account's created, we have to keep it safe through the whole lifetime of that relationship. There's got to be this constant monitoring of account integrity, phone integrity, uh, identity integrity. Assuming we're sure at all times that we're uh, really talking to the right person on the right device, no compromises, now we got to engage each other. We have to be able to send messages over voice, text messaging, social applications like WhatsApp or Viber, no matter where you are in the world. And that really means no matter. 195 countries, uh, half a dozen different platforms. We got to be able to find each other to ask questions, give shipment notifications, security prompts like a two factor authentication. And then lastly, there's got to be fraud protection anytime something of value is being exchanged. What Telesign does is we are a one-stop shop that protects that entire journey of a consumer and an enterprise being together. You, you mentioned something that really stuck out to me. And how are you able to look at users or how do you have the bandwidth to be able to look at users on the regional level? Um, you know, it is, it's quite interesting. There, there's a couple of different regional levels we spend a lot of time on. So first of all, because we service 1,700 enterprises daily, including eight of the 10 largest, uh, uh, most valuable brands on the internet, their customers aren't regional. Their customers are indeed uh, spread across a hundred plus countries around the world. You know, some of our, our public customers out there uh, from our uh, pipe deck include companies like TikTok, Chinese company that has taken the world by storm, United States, Europe, um, uh, the rest of Asia and beyond. So um, initially, we were following these amazing, huge companies like TikTok, Alibaba, Skype, and our other customers. And they required us, there was business for us to get if we had uh, the ability to deliver messages to and provide security for people in 195 countries. Now, over time, there's been this little extra piece of work we've been on we've put on top to deal with regional players so indeed we have that last little bit that the bank in brazil needs in order to service the customers in brazil but um this is a bit of what you get from a company that's been at this 17 years um if you sent me off tomorrow with uh, gary's money to do a startup I couldn't be here in a year. This gets built up brick by brick. Now you cited a few customers there, but could you give more context to kind of build into that foundation of what your customer segments look like? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, once again, it's uh, great. Gary and I have pitched our investor deck so many times. I'm seeing the slide in my head. It's hilarious. So um, approximately speaking from a customer segment perspective, uh, we're something like 35, 38% e-commerce. So if you think of the biggest e-commerce companies in the world uh, by revenue, about 35, 38% e-commerce. 
uh, 30-some percent social networks. So TikTok and some of the other large uh, social networks out there, very large ones. Um, enterprise software is about 25% uh, enterprise software companies. And then um, a nice uh, a, a nice toe hold, I think just under 10% in gaming. And in this case, I don't mean gambling, I mean video gaming um, uh, type games around the world. Nice, to, uh, nice start in fintech, share economy, and then a and then a long tail. So literally any of these things that where you have meaningful experiences from a mobile device, we're there to connect, protect, and engage um, uh, every one of those interactions. An interesting one, Dan, as, as, a, as part of the exercise of getting to know each other, um, my family did a, a little audit on how often we use telesign daily. Uh, so that's myself, my wife, and my two kids across e-commerce sites, social media, gaming, et cetera. And it was, it was averaging 10 to 12 times every day that we were using Telesign from Europe. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's working away behind the scenes. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's already becoming ubiquitous. So that, that actually offers a, a pretty good sample that really any viewer could take a look at and identify just how often they're actually using this. Yeah, now, now, now Gary has the luxury of knowing the list of customers, so he's uh, 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 guessing which websites it's in, but I think that's right. If you are a digital first online person, either on the website or in particular from the mobile phone, you're, there's an excellent chance you're using Telesign three, five, 10, 15 times a day, depending upon what you're doing. It offers a sort of a natural segue into your uh, recent Q1 release. Um, what stuck out to me, and, and you certainly commented on this, is the growth in digital identity. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on this and what does this offer as an opportunity going forward? Yeah, you bet. I mean, we, um, once again, I'm, incredibly proud of the performance here at Telesign. I mean, we are, you know, just building the business up one tick at a time. Q1 was exactly what we said it would be, which is quite nice. I mean, it shows a nice, uh, a nice uh, predictability in the business already. Some of what, uh, I don't have the Q1 numbers in front of me, but some of what we said we would do was deliver very solid growth on the communication side. Communications being either text messages, Vibers, WhatsApps that we're sending, either uh, just your package has been shipped, uh, you need to log back in, or two-factor authentication. The SMS that says type in this pin. All of that fits in the communication segment that, I, that was growing in the teens, I believe. On the digital identity side, these are those machine learning oriented products that really help connect, protect, and defend online digital identity huge uh, opportunity going forward about, um, uh, it'll all, I'll never forget, last year, digital identity theft was $56 billion alone, just digital identity, not cybercrime, just that piece. We think we have a very um, differentiated solution so as we're out there, uh, as we're out there marketing to and engaging, literally, you know, uh, my sales team always asks me, where do I go hunt? Where does the marketing team hunt? And I say, flip through your phone, find the hundred apps there. And that's where you hunt. That's an account that needs protected. Um, as we've really turned up our uh, marketing engine, both in the US and across the uh, globe, um, we've seen that extraordinarily uh, strong uh, digital identity growth in Q1 that we predicted. So pretty, uh, pretty proud of that. Both sides of the business are important. 
we're great at both, but the digital identity side, we feel like we got something quite differentiated. And we're talking a lot about uh, these numerous interactions on a daily basis from end users. Um, and then that's translating into uh, your customers and basically their customers. But what does that actually mean for your revenue model? Well, you know, the revenue model at Telesign um, um, is primarily today um, a, uh, a usage based model. So everything at Telesign is a web service. Somebody goes to log on to the mobile phone, the enterprise web server calls a Telesign API. We get a piece of money every time they call us. Okay. Um, the uh, nevertheless, the uh, the the net revenue retention tends to be quite high. Number one, because we do a great job, we have great relationships. We uh, uh, as people's usage grows, they grow with us. But also, when you think about our digital identity, when you think about those scores and those reason codes I described a little bit ago. Um, this is something where they call our API and they get an answer, and then it's very integrated into the logic of our uh, of our customer systems. They're making key financial and security decisions based on what we have to say. So once they integrate us in, clearly they could write us out if we did a bad job, but as long as we get better all the time, which we do, long as we keep servicing them, it tends to be a quite sticky, uh, a quite sticky model. There is some um, uh, customers that have moved to a subscription model as well, where they you know, uh, have a monthly commit for three years or whatever. And yes, we're trying to move farther that direction, but this consumption based, uh, based pricing is what the company's been built on. Daniel, Joe touched on something that's that, uh, that, that was very interesting to us during our due diligence. Uh, my background in, in, in traditional telecoms and, and pay TV involves a lot of churn management, uh, trying to prevent your customers leaving your service every month. Um, whereas when we looked at Telesign and saw that they had a net revenue retention of 120 to 140% over the last number of years. And I, I drilled into that. I'm like, how, how can this be? What that... What that looks like it's saying is that not only are they keeping their customers, but those customers are spending more with Telesign every month. And that's exactly what it was. And so if, if, if that isn't a, a tick of the box for what Joe and his team are doing correctly, and it, it, we all speak of loyalty, but these organizations have their own bottom line to manage and, and they will only stay with you if, if you are doing the absolute best in class, um, and particularly in relation to what Telesign do to, to, to protect and defend. Um, so this, was, this, this finding was, was so interesting for us. So with that high retention and consumption, where does it actually offer the greatest opportunity? Is it with existing customers or new customers? Um, you know, it really is both. Um, first of all, in spite of the fact that 1,700 customers doing business every day, including some great big ones, um, there's really two things that are pretty exciting. Number one, we feel like we are in the first or second inning, uh, to use a baseball term, of penetrating this industry. It ain't half time, it's not even close, okay? We have 1,700 very large companies. There are at, uh, both moving down market as well as moving internationally, a lot, a lot of green field for us, new logos that need penetrated. And frankly, we're not even, um, we're not even displacing another vendor. We're displacing in many cases, a terrible old name and password system that isn't very secure. 
we're displacing a, a highly insecure system with something a little better, taking something off the hands of the developers. So lots of greenfield. But one of the things that excites me on the, uh, I don't know if I'd say easy money, but we've quoted a few times, um, our customers, when we survey them, they see us as providing them three things. Um, identity and authentication is one, communications is two, and fraud protection is three. So communications, identity, fraud. When we look at those 1,700 customers, about 35% of those customers buy two out of three. So the great news of that is I think cross-sell, upsell has been proven, but yet we haven't focused on it as much as we can. So when I look at levers for growth going forward, there really are three of them. Lever one is existing use case, just increased volume. As the customer grows, we grow with them. Cross-sell, a customer buys uh, fraud protection and we're able to add digital engagement or vice versa. And then number three is, of course, knocking down new logos around the world. And a lot of, uh, frankly, the reason for us of uh, going through this transaction, we're already making money, we're already a $400 million business, but there's more we want to do faster. So building out that sales team uh, so we can simultaneously go after all three vectors of growth really is, uh, really is the focus for the next year or two here. You, you just hit on, uh, I guess, the, the natural next point of that expanded sales team, but where you are displacing uh, really an archaic model, and uh, to use that baseball analogy, there's still a lot of green field. Um, what did your sales force look like maybe two or three years ago? What does it look like now? And then to capture that opportunity going forward, what do you need to uh, have in place both from the sales front and for the support staff? Yeah, so actually, very pleased that we have the right model already in place. I think a few years ago at Telesign, um, um, we had this amazing, perfect market fit. What I mean by that is they invented this product ahead of its time and um, uh, taking nothing away from our amazing sales force, but people just found us. I mean, if they were worried about this, if they were worried about this, they would query on the internet, digital identity, hacking prevention on cell phones, and they'd give us a call. In many cases, our sales force literally just read when somebody had been hacked and rang them up and said, we could keep that from happening again, and that was the sales methodology. Still a lot of that going on, but we've moved to a very traditional, additional to that, a very traditional digital marketing, SEO, SEM, targeting the chief security officers, the chief e-commerce people within the Fortune 5000 and beyond. So actually targeting them with inbound leads, uh, a sales development team that's uh, calling and setting meetings, and then sales reps that are actually knocking it down. But this is still not what I would call a hard sell as much as just putting a normal lead gen process in place. Process is in place. Customer success team is in place. The real work we've been doing is adding those local teams around the world where, frankly, we have uh, taken our relatively small sales team. We've doubled it this year primarily uh, internationally, doubling it again next year, and it will still be incredibly efficient in comparison to many people in the industry. So with that, what's the size of the current market and where do you fit with that? You know, when we look at digital identity and, and um, messaging CPAS put together, a couple of years back, the market was 
in the neighborhood of 20 billion, and correct me if I'm off much, Gary, I don't know if you can remember the slide from memory, but that market that we participate in was about 20 billion, growing to about 50 billion in just about five or six years. So a 24% compound annual growth rate in this market. Um, and over the first couple of years, that's absolutely what we've seen. So part of the reason we're so enthusiastic about the business and the transaction is, um, you know, um, it's great to be good. It's even better to be lucky. And we think we're both. OK, we got this great company sitting exactly in the crosshairs of two growing industries at exactly the right time. But that, that is huge growth to go from 20 billion to 50 in such a short time. What do you account for the biggest catalyst for that? You know, the, the catalyst, uh, the great news is um, we all can understand the catalyst. If you think about three years ago, how much of your life was actually going on on your phone? And the answer is, you might have been doing phone calls, you might have been browsing, you might have been checking Facebook, but my goodness, you know, this week I've done significant banking with three different companies. I have uh, live on my phone to do my job every single day. I've talked to my doctor, nothing was wrong by the way. Um, I have uh, done gaming with my son. Um, literally, as you watch um, your in, the increased richness of your life on the internet and, and in particular the mobile internet, so goes Telesign in the background, connecting, protecting and defending all of that. And when you consider then that outside of the United States and outside of Western Europe, the majority of people's interaction with technology platforms is via the mobile phone only. In, in, in the next few years, Africa alone by 2050 will have a billion people in Africa alone, who, and most of them will have never have actually had access to a PC. So, so this growth of 50 billion continues um, as more and more people um, access digital platforms via the mobile phone particularly, and as well as that, as smaller organizations, not just these global behemoths, um, but a smaller mom and pop uh, e-commerce type organizations also need to protect and defend their consumers you know so it's 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 growing uh, across the world but it's also growing uh, through the various value chains so so this growth continues now as long as we're talking about the entirety of the space anybody doing due diligence um, for this transaction is inevitably going to be confronted with twilio um, and you know, the parallels drawn there but are there any other competitors that they should be mindful of uh, you know, there's a there's a lot, lot of companies out there, and um, um, like you say, Twilio comes up comes up a lot. Good company, nothing bad as to say about Twilio. If you want to dump, uh, you know, whatever fifty million coupons on somebody in North America, and you want to do it well, Twilio comes to mind. If you want to do two-factor authentication, digital identity, and that's really your focus globally. And then you want to uh, perhaps also send some engagement uh, SMSs. That's where we tend to shine. So we tend to uh, see Twilio a little bit in the security space, but they're a little more adjacent to us than right on, uh, right on the bullseye with us. Um, yeah. There's other Twilio competitors, Cinch, Infobip, et cetera. Same thing. If you want to send coupons, if you want to send SMSs in a particular region, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. But if you're looking for this global, fast, accurate, end-to-end -end engagement, that's really the telesign sweet spot. It's why we have those top, top uh, brands. 
Well, with that, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you so much for having us. It was a lot of fun.